Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and I'm excited to share with you my game dev progress for this month. I'm building a voxel game engine of massive scale, an infinite world in which users can create and interact. When we left off last episode, I had just perfected the rotation portion of my physics system, and had made it so that when you chopped down a tree or cut a divot into the ground, the objects reacted in a realistic fashion. After releasing that video, I went on a vacation for about two weeks, I drove across the country and spent some time in nature, and didn't write any code. Well, that's a lie. I wrote about 50 lines of code. But you get the point. It was very relaxing, but as soon as I got back, I was back to work on the voxel game engine. My goal this month has been to polish the physics engine, because while most of the features were complete by the time that I released my last devlog, it wasn't that polished and there were some performance improvements that needed to be made. Namely, I added three things this month, object despawning, object sleeping, and multi-threading that have taken the performance of my physics engine to the next level. Let's look at each of these in turn. They say that the best way to improve an algorithm's performance is to simply do less work. In my engine, this means getting rid of objects that are no longer necessary. When you chop down a tree or dig a hole in the ground, you leave behind a bunch of debris, voxels that have gotten disconnected from the bark or from the dirt that are just there for show. You're not really going to need to interact with these again, most likely, sort of like dropping an item on the ground in Minecraft. So after a certain period of time, the engine can despawn them. One commenter had an idea that I really liked for this, which was that when the engine despawns an object, it shouldn't just make it disappear, but instead it should make it merge, it should make it fuse back with the main voxel grid so it becomes part of the terrain again. I really liked this idea and couldn't help but implement it as soon as I saw it. I wrote a script to modify a voxel object by applying some affine linear transformation and then re-rasterizing it into the main voxel grid. And I made the engine despawn any debris objects on the ground after a certain period of time. But I also made it so that these objects didn't despawn until the player's back was turned. So for example, I'm looking at a tree here that I just chopped down, and if I walk away a little bit and turn around, and then turn back, voila! The tree has become part of the terrain once again, and it's no longer taking up any physics processing power. It feels very smooth and polished, and it isn't jarring because you don't typically observe the object going from an independent entity to part of the terrain. So thank you very much to Magitech, I hope that's how I pronounce it, for suggesting this idea. Moving on, I next implemented object sleeping. Object sleeping is a common feature of physics engines, and the idea is basically that most objects in the scene aren't changing frame to frame. So you can put objects to sleep, that is, skip collision detection code for those objects, when there's nothing in the scene that would have possibly changed them. For example, look at this box sitting on the ground. It'll be sitting on the ground the next server tick, and the next, and the next, without any external forces acting on it. I implemented this in my engine by keeping track of when each object was last changed by the physics code. When it comes time to process an object by moving it and checking for collisions, I look to see if this object changed position the last time that physics code ran on it, and I also evaluate whether any of the objects in its immediate surroundings changed within the past few ticks. If everything is the same with respect to the last time that this object was processed, then I know that the physics results will be exactly the same. The object didn't change its position last tick, and so it won't change its position this tick either. Therefore, my physics engine skips doing any processing on this object, which can save a large amount of time. The biggest, most expensive objects in my engine right now are these trees, and collision detection code for these trees typically takes one to two milliseconds. 
Before, by the time I had chopped down 10 or 20 trees, the collision detection loop was taking 14 or 15 milliseconds, which is not good, because I only have a budget of about 25 milliseconds per tick. My game loop runs every 25 milliseconds, so it needs to be done processing everything. After implementing object sleeping, I was able to fly around the world and chop down as many trees as I wanted, because as soon as a tree had fallen down and was resting firmly on the ground, it no longer took up any collision processing time at all. This was another big performance improvement. I coupled these improvements with the icing on the cake, CPU multi-threading. Most home PCs have four to eight cores, which means that they can execute four to eight independent programs simultaneously. I took advantage of this in my engine by creating a thread pool that would assign different objects in the scene to different threads to process. So I wrote an example program here that you can see it takes 10 trees that are resting on the ground and runs collision detection on each of them. And the total time that thread spent processing in this test program was 23 milliseconds. So if every object had run sequentially on a single core, this program would have taken 23 milliseconds. But because this was running on multiple threads, four threads were simultaneously picking out different objects to work on, this took only nine real-time milliseconds on my CPU. That's a factor of over 50% improvement, which is huge. Together, these things should help my game scale to larger scenes and more players. I also added task-level parallelism by parallelizing my event system, Geese. Geese is the architecture on which my game is built. And the idea is that if I want to add new functionality to my engine, I declare a new event system, which listens for events and can raise events as well. It can also depend on other systems, and this means that it can call methods on them and access, even potentially mutate, their internal state. Now the beautiful thing about Geese is that if you have two systems, that need to process events, and those systems are not dependencies of one another, they can both run those events simultaneously. To those systems, it can still appear that events are executing sequentially because those systems cannot observe one another, but under the hood, everything is happening faster simultaneously. And so Geese was originally single-threaded, but I recently went through, redid the internals of it, and made it multi-threaded. It makes it really easy to add more task parallelism to my engine. If I want to add task parallelism, I just add more systems, which is sort of a natural thing to do anyway. I would be sort of curious down in the comments section for all of the Rust users out there, and specifically for those who have used Bevy. What do you think of event-driven architectures like my geese for game dev versus an entity component architecture like Bevy? I tend to prefer my event-driven system because it allows me to more easily deal with one-off events like a player logging in, and I can still use an ECS. I have an ECS, it's just a single system. So the event-driven architecture feels a bit more general to me. But I'd be curious to know what you guys think. Please do leave a comment about that or anything else. Otherwise, that's all I have for you guys today. So please like the video and subscribe to be on the lookout for the next episode. In that video, I'm hoping to focus on developing a plugin and modding API for my engine so that I can finally get to creating some real games in it. With that, thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.